Warning, this video will contain massive spoilers for the Legend of Korra series finale. If you have not seen the finale, then why are you watching this video? Pause the video, go to nick.com, watch the finale, then resume. And lastly, everything said in this video is just my opinion. If you have a differing opinion, then just f***ing go in the comments below. And let me know. There's no need for animosity here. I love you. So, the series finale for The Legend of Korra aired this past Friday on Nickelodeon and Nick.com, and since the show ended, everybody has been talking about one thing. That badass mech fight! Now, while both fights with the mech were amazing, my jaw literally dropped when all the Earthbenders collapsed in an entire building, and you don't care about this at all, do you? Well, what about when Asami's father sacrificed himself in order to- nope. Nope, not that either. Okay, well what about when Barak and Zuli finally did the thing? Okay, fine, Korosami, Korosami, that's all anybody wants to talk about, right? Korosami this, Korosami that. Fine. For those uninitiated in the recent Avatar universe, Korosami is the name that shippers online have given to the coupling of Korra, the main character, and Avatar, and Asami, the daughter of a billionaire inventor. But why, you might inquire in a false feeble grandfather voice, would people choose these two to couple over any other characters in the series? Well, to answer that question, we're gonna have to go into their backstories a little bit. The two first met through Mako, the pretty boy hero type that Korra had been in love with since the first season when suddenly, for her at least, he began to date Asami. This of course drove a wedge between Korra and Mako, which was made even wedgier when Korra began to suspect Asami's father, the aforementioned billionaire inventor, of being in cahoots with that season's main villain. But as it turns out, her suspicions weren't driven by jealousy, as Mako originally thought, but were spot on. Asami, upon discovering that her father was an evil douchebag working for an even eviler bag of douche, was sent into a shame spiral, while Mako in turn was sent into the awaiting lips of Korra via the Cheating Bastard Express. To Mako's credit, however, he did soon break it off with Asami and end up in a real relationship with Korra. And luckily for the team, Asami was eventually able to get past all of this and stuck around, being a badass inventor, fighter, and heir to a fortune. Basically, she's Batman. Now, I realize after hearing all of this, Korra and Asami probably don't come off as the couple that you'd bet on ending up together. I mean, if I woke up one day and realized I was gay, the first guy I'd bang probably wouldn't be the guy that sent my father to jail and followed it up by stealing my girlfriend. But luckily, that's not where our story ends. You see Mako and Korra eventually break up because they're fucking teenagers. Duh. And after this, Korra and Asami begin to become closer friends, realizing that the two have more in common than just the last guy they tongue fought with. And this relationship, as friends, begins to grow over the next few seasons, neither character really focusing romantically on anyone at all for the rest of the series. The two become such good friends, in fact, that after season 3, Korra is left severely injured and upon healing up, decides to just disappear from the world, taking time to be by herself and try to figure out exactly who she really is. And in that time, she contacts no one, not her teacher, not her friends, not her family, no one. Except for Asami. As it turns out, over that span of about five or six months wherein she was gone, the two had actually kept in contact via mail without anyone else's knowledge. Now, while I realize that for some people that would constitute some undercover lesbian love, and for me, it just went to show that how, of all the people that Korra had, a list that would be entirely too long to go through adequately in this video, that Asami was the only one she could trust not to judge or have expectations of her. It made sense for the situation, it made sense for the story, and most importantly, it made sense for the characters. But that alone does not constitute a romantic relationship. I mean, it's not like the two walked hand in hand into a pool of light and looked longingly into one another's eyes before being transported to a magical world where they could finally be alone. Roll credits! Now the question on everybody's mind is, was this just fan service from the creators? Was this the story of two friends going on an adventure? Or was this something more? The shippers say yes, this was a romantic conclusion, citing scenes like one earlier in the season where Asami complimented Korra and she blushed as proof of attraction. The anti-shippers say no, that the two were just friends and the show never explicitly stated that they had any interest in one another at all, and also that it just wouldn't fit Korra's personality. But here's the one thing that I think people on both sides aren't really seeing. It doesn't matter. That's kind of been the point for both these characters throughout the last half of the series. Neither one needs a romantic relationship to be fulfilled. They both existed and thrived, yes, with the help of their friends, but also on their own. They both had interesting and compelling stories that didn't revolve around any form of romantic attachment, and that, to me, is the discussion we should be having. These incredibly complex characters should not be boiled down by the fans merely to sexual orientation. For four seasons, Mike and Brian have given us characters that regardless of gender or orientation, we would relate to. As a matter of fact, Nickelodeon originally didn't even want to greenlight Korra because they thought that little boys wouldn't be able to relate to a female protagonist. But in screens for the pilot, they found just the opposite. Boys didn't care that she was a girl, just that she was badass, and that is exactly what both these characters are. Badass. And to focus solely on the ambiguousness of the ending really does a disservice to the entire series as a whole. The point was never about who Korra would end up with, it was about letting people know that no matter who you are 
or where you come from that we as human beings are all complex creatures capable of greatness. It's a point that this show continuously goes out of its way to make, from the brothers Bolin and Mako, who grew up as childhood thieves and ended up as heroes all the way to the end of the series, wherein the villain was forced to see the error of her ways, and while she didn't become a good guy per se, she did eventually accept punishment for her deeds. They've shown time and again through each of their characters a faith in humanity, a belief that we are all capable of growing, of learning, and of redemption. The point of the series to me was never about Korra finding love. It was about Korra finding Korra, which is something she struggled with time and again throughout the series, and to completely look past that and focus only on who she would end up with at the end is almost offensive to the story. But with all that being said, that doesn't mean the ending should be ignored. It definitely shouldn't. It should be looked at, but it shouldn't be the centerpiece for the entire series. It shouldn't be the sole focus, and no matter which way it was intended to go, it should in no way take anything away from the rest of the series for anyone. Now, for my money, as someone who really loves the show and deeply respects its creators, I personally choose to interpret the ending as the beginning of a romantic relationship. Mike and Brian have always pushed the envelope in the Avatar universe, and never more so than in Korra. They've shown the best in humanity and the worst. They've shown realistic relationships with realistic endings, and even murder. They've never shied away from the hard questions, forcing their characters to face everything from anarchism and fascism to their own self-doubt. So from that perspective, I see no reason why they would shy away from anything as benign as a same-sex couple. Not to mention that that final scene is a pretty close mirror to the final scene in The Last Airbender, where Aang and Katara finally kissed. For me, all the pieces are there. It totally makes sense that these two would be drawn to one another eventually, and I really like the idea of the end of the series signifying a new beginning. But that doesn't take away from anything that I've said prior. The end scene is just that. A scene. It's not the entire finale, and it doesn't encompass the series as a whole. But what it does do, and has done, is get people talking. The ending is open to interpretation, and it was done so deliberately. Mike and Brian wanted to get people talking to open dialogue, and if the censors would have let them, they probably would have done even more to make it happen. And honestly, from my perspective, that's something that needed to happen. In 1908, a French artist by the name of Emile Cole created what historians believe to be the first traditional animation. And since then, America's been at the forefront of animation, taking the ball and spiking it in the end zone with companies like Disney, Hanna-Barbera, and Warner Brothers. And in that time, tons of cartoon relationships have been developed. Everything from boy and girl relationships to mouse and mouse relationships to interspecies relationships. But the one thing that seems to get constantly passed over, at least on a large-scale American network, is same-sex relationships. And considering how many different types of relationships we see in Japanese animation alone, I think it just goes to show how progressive we as a country really aren't. In this day and age, I think it's long past time that we've accepted people for who they are and who they want to be with. But the second children are subjected to it, we suddenly stop progressing, assuming anything that we perceive to be out of the norm to be dangerous or corrupt. And that is just not right. If we are ever to become tolerant as a people, we must first be accepting that other ideas and cultures exist outside of our own and are equally valid. And to those who think that introducing a same-sex couple into a cartoon will corrupt our youth, here's my reply. Of all the tweets and feedback that I've seen about this show's ending since its premiere, only a small fraction has been negative, and of that, none of it has come from their target audience. Children. So if they can be accepting of the idea, if they can look past it and see the show for what it really is and all that it has done, and if they can accept and love these characters regardless of who the characters themselves love, then why can't we? In the words of Maya Angelou, love heals, heals and liberates. I use the word love not meaning sentimentality, but a condition so strong that it may be that which holds the stars in their heavenly positions and that which causes the blood to flow orderly in our veins. So in summation, I want to thank Mike and Brian and everyone at Nickelodeon for bringing us seven plus years of amazing stories and characters, for opening discussion on multiple issues and never being afraid to tackle the hard questions and big moments that life inevitably brings with it. So on behalf of all the fans, thank you. We can only hope that one day you'll invite us back into your world to continue the saga that we've all grown with and have grown to love. So what did you guys think about the finale? Did you love it? Did you hate it? And what did you think about the whole Korasami thing? Let me know down in the comments below and instead of my normal stick where I ask you guys to like and subscribe and all that, instead I'm going to ask for the one thing I've never asked for. Share it. I feel like above all else, discussion is the precursor to understanding, and that is exactly why I made this video. So it could be discussed openly. Anyways guys, happy holidays and thanks for watching. Sorry guys, uh, one more thing before I go. You see that video right there, the one you just watched? 
Yeah, that was supposed to be up like four days ago, but all my files got deleted, so I had to reshoot and re-edit, and that's why it's up now. But my excuses for being late and wanting to do some weird meta outro aren't exactly the reason for this PS. You see, right in the middle of my editing, I came across this Kotaku post, this, th this one right here. Yeah, that one. And in this post, Mike and Brian, the guys who created Korra, they go on to explain the ending, and that it was exactly what everyone thought. A romantic relationship. So I kind of wanted to address this at the end of the video without having to reshoot the entire thing again. And really all I'm going to say on the matter is, I was wrong. See, earlier in this video I said that Mike and Brian wanted to get people talking, but that wasn't right. What they really wanted to do, and what I didn't get while writing the script, is the same thing anybody that creates anything wants to do. They wanted to tell a story. And for me at least, they did it perfectly. So if either of you ever see this, I'm sorry for making assumptions. And um, well, great job.